Uh, so, yeah, uh, the topic is machine learning bias and uh, my name is Abdul Majid. Uh, just a little bit about me, uh, I work as uh, an analyst in uh, Cisco um, for a team called Marketing Insights and Optimization. It is a data science team set up within a uh, marketing organization. We cover both uh, EMR and uh, EPJC. And other than my work, I actually write a lot. You might uh, find my name online anywhere. And, uh, yeah, so I also run a meetup group called Bangalore R user group. So uh, it's uh, like uh, by data, which is an umbrella of uh, R, Python, Julia. So I have a separate meetup group. So anytime if you are interested in uh, joining us, it's a free meetup. Uh, just have to get up early on Saturdays. That is the biggest problem. So you can just come and attend our talks. Um, yeah, that's it. So we'll uh, get into the round. How many of you have heard about machine learning bias? Probably, yeah. So a couple of people. And uh, what, what, what do you think machine learning bias is? Maybe from the point of view, there is this amount of, uh, there are several cases of uh, last people getting, uh, you know, basically compiled by the yeah. model, getting yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, this is going to be the outline, not more important. Um, okay, so the, it's a, you know, a very quick baby slide to ask you. Would you believe if I tell computers that? Because um, you know, since we uh, we, have, we were growing up, there, there is one common belief, right? So if you have an accountant, and that accountant would probably fudge your numbers. If you have uh, a CA, probably they would probably fudge your numbers. But a computer would never fudge your numbers. A computer is something that would always speak truth. This is all the things that we have always heard. But what happens is, computers actually uh, kind of lie uh, when humans uh, make it in such a way. This is a very famous example. I think uh, he was talking about pasta day. This is this is a famous example. I took it from Rachel uh, Rachel's presentation about uh, the same topic that we need more inclusivity in AI. So the whole idea is there are two kind of languages that humans talk. Right? There is one language which is uh, gender specific. Like uh, you have khaki, so like that in Hindi. So and then the, there is a language which is gender neutral. So for everything, it is the same thing. There is no female uh, differentiation. So like that, what happens is English, uh, which has uh, gender specific words, when it gets translated to Finnish, which does not have any gender specific, and then when it gets translated back in Google Translate, so what happens is it uh, treats the doctor who is actually supposedly a female and then it converts it to a male. So this is a typical problem like uh, how we explain. It's a very uh, famous use case of you know why uh, we have to understand what is happening in machine learning bias. And then the next thing is um, there are more problems. Actually this is not just with Google Translate. Uh, like he actually exactly mentioned this was a feature on Google Photos and uh, it, it actually saw black people's pictures and then it classified it as gorilla. You know, for us, probably the background that we are coming up with, probably we might actually joke at it or laugh at it and then we'll just walk away. But imagine someone from Africa who's also living their life on the same planet but not getting equal privileges on an app, even on an app, like forget about everything else, university or any other thing, even on an app, they have not got equal privileges and they've been classified like this. So, this is actually a big problem. And now you might think that I've got something against Google and then uh, you know Sundar Pichai did not give me offer so I'm talking everything bad about Google. So let's go to Microsoft. So I think uh, this was a huge, huge PR disaster for Microsoft. Microsoft actually created for a good PR and then it became a huge PR disaster. So Tay was supposed to be you know, this millennial bot who talks millennial language. I think the biggest mistake Microsoft actually did is they used Reddit data to train this bot and uh, those who have ever used Reddit, you actually know how Reddit is. Reddit is so diverse, you have a lot of good things like you have good machine learning subreddit, you have good uh, R subreddit, you have good subreddit for Python, you have good subreddit for everything. But at the same time, it has a lot of subreddit which are like this. It has um, white supremacy, you have anti-Semitism, you have everything that you talk about that is bad happening in the society, Reddit has a subreddit for it. And, uh, I think probably you know uh, some of you might know 4chan also uh, those subreddits are like uh, you know the minimalistic version of 4chan. So then this happened and uh, Microsoft had to take this bot down and this is another example that uh, he exactly mentioned uh, it was published by a, a group called Pro Publica so you can um, read about it. So just by looking at someone's face uh, we have this assumption that okay just because she looks black then she is more criminal than this guy but ultimately this guy tends to be more criminal. The reason is again the same prejudice that we have in our society when we put it inside data like he exactly mentioned your machine learning models algorithm is as good as the data that you actually created and 
what the, the data that you exactly feed in inside it, it is going to learn. It's like a, it's like a kid, right? Anytime you see a black person and you teach the kid that this is a bad guy, bad guy, bad guy, and then when the kid grows up, that kid is of course going to believe that this is a bad guy, not respecting he is actually a human, but it will have this prejudice in his mind. So the same thing is happening. Okay, yeah. Uh, so until now, all these things I actually mentioned because uh, now we know a point where we understand that machine learning bias exists. So. I think uh, there is a famous philosophical statement. If you want to fix a problem first, you have to understand or accept that there is a problem that is existing. So we understood. So the second problem is um, probably we may not have to care much about machine learning bias as long as machine learning bias is sitting inside, you know, probably a, a, a someone's machine or a, it is within uh, someone's organization. But what is happening is machine learning is being used in credit scoring. Imagine someone is just being a black or is coming from a you know, backward society and he is not getting score, he is not getting a loan because his credit score is bad, then this is a fault in machine learning because we have made a machine learning model which is now denying something that is that, that is his right, first problem. So the second problem is how machine learning is being used in a lot of countries, especially uh, recently you might have seen uh, so much in London. Actually, there is a huge debate that uh, between this China and Hong Kong discussion, China is heavily investing in machine learning to you know identify faces. But also the issue with, uh, that is happening in London is that a lot of people are actually you know signing petitions against it because of the fact that these are not foolproof mechanisms. And uh, when you deploy this solution in a social system, and uh, it, it is going to be hugely disturb your social system because as a human you may know okay probably might think okay he's a bad guy he's not a bad guy he's my neighbor he's my friend you understand all these things but a pure algorithm would not understand all these things until we explicitly feed in this data so that is the second problem that we are facing and the third thing that you might have heard, read a lot uh, in the news that amazon is selling its facial recognition technique to pentagon um, us military all these things and there are a lot of false positives that have been detected in Amazon facial reduction technique, but still they are, they are selling it. Probably it's up to the buyer whether they want to validate it. But the problem is, anytime something comes into a social system, then there is a problem. For example, in a lot of judiciary, um, you know, uh, case solving, people are trying to use machine learning in that. And then imagine now you have a biased machine learning model and then you want to put that machine learning model into that judiciary system. And irrespective of what the judges is, and there is a huge case list that judges even have their prejudice and based on their prejudice, they give judgment. That's why a lot of anonymous things are being tried out. So the point is, when something enters social system, we as humans have to now take a step back, like probably we are all developers, right? But at the end of the day, we are all humans. So we have to probably take a step back and then leave the developer notion because um, if you if you go to a guy and then tell him like your model sucks, of course this guy is not going to entertain your you know uh, friendship or whatever it is because it is a pride that I take in my work. But ultimately, what happens is if my work is going to deny job for someone, if my work is going to deny judgment for someone, then it is a big problem, which is what we have to understand. And that is one of the reasons you know I am actually giving this talk in multiple different groups because this word has to spread. Uh, if you see, this is a much, much mature discussion in uh, countries outside India, but uh, probably because of the nature, the way, the way we have brought up with huge diversity, and then sometimes, you know, uh, th that is one of the reasons we don't care about it much, but uh, probably this is the time for us to, you know, understand more about it. So, yeah, what is machine learning bias? A uh, machine learning bias is nothing but an algorithm which is unfair and uh, what do we call as unfair is when a machine learning bias or a machine learning algorithm misses fairness when when something does not have fairness let's say you uh, there is a huge case right everywhere whenever a Bollywood actor goes to airport buy some water bottle and then uh, I think there was a recently a case with five star hotel where a Bollywood star went to the five star hotel and he bought a water bottle or something and then they charged huge amount then there was a case this whole premise is set on unfairness because it is not, there is no fairness in that argument because a bottle costs 10 rupees, why do you sell it for 40 rupees? The same way we call an algorithm is unfair when it does not have fairness, when it misses fairness, right? And uh, now the problem is, what is fairness? Uh, this being a research area and uh, emerging area in machine learning itself, there is no common consensus among what is the standard definition of fairness. So what a lot of researchers have done is, where is fairness highly used in the world, which is a legal system, right, judiciary system. So that is where people started looking into it to see, okay, can we adopt some definition from the legal judiciary system into our machine learning or computer science era to see, uh, you know, if we can adopt some definition. 
So based on that, they have created uh, two categories of fairness, which is uh, first your group fairness and then the second one is your individual fairness. Group fairness is very simple. What is it? It is uh, if you are uh, trying to do something for two different groups, both the groups should have the same probability of getting something, you know, the likelihood should be same for getting something done. So that is when you try to treat both the groups. So the way you prepare your data is to treat the groups as similar things. And then the individual fairness is a group is actually a composition of individuals, right? So what happens is when you take individuals from two different groups or across your data set, both the data points should have the same likelihood of getting something done. So this is a very clear definition of how group fairness and individual fairness is defined. But for us to get slightly deep into it, and then so this slide is titled as causes, but you can also um, you know use this as definition and um, anything around it. So the primary problem with uh, machine learning biases, like he exactly mentioned, data is the main thing. Uh, so first is skewed sample. What is uh, skewed sample? And you would actually see more uh, definitions than this, but I have just picked five definitions in here. What is skewed sample? A skewed sample is, uh, of course, we all know the sample which is skewed, which is like two mark answer for a ten standard examination. But exactly what it does is. Imagine this is a place, this is Square Mama, and you want to build a crime prediction model, much like minority report we have seen that movie. So if you, if you want to do a machine learning model for a, my, uh, crime prediction, prediction uh, for Bangalore, and then you have got Core Mama. And imagine Core Mangala had a police station for uh, about 100 years, and uh, let us assume that Indian police are, hypothetically assume that Indian police have been very diligent in uh, recording all these things, in fairness. So you have got enough data for Code Mangala, but now there is a place called HSR layer. And in the HSR layer, there was no police office for the last 100 years. And then last 10 years, there was a police office, a police office, a police station there, and they have their records. Now, if you use this for building a crime prediction model, imagine where would your model say that there is more likelihood of crime happening? Of course, Code Mangala, because you have got huge data for Code Mangala, and you have no data for uh, your uh, HSR layer data. You know. And this is the problem with skewed sample. So data in itself is not available. So the second one is the tainted sample, which is uh, tainted example, which is what uh, the uh, case we saw with the uh, the language embedding thing, uh, the uh, Google Translate thing, which is because we have a prejudice and we have constantly put that prejudice and that is they are available in the data that we have used for the last 50 years. And now if we use that data, which is already biased or uh, probably with our prejudice, what we had in our society. And then if we use that to build a machine learning model, then probably that is a tainted example case. And then limited features. Imagine you are trying to collect data and uh, it is quite easy to collect enough data with enough features, features are your columns, right? Enough features in a place where data is easily, you know, you can find it. For example, you want to uh, find the data about an app, let's say Netflix app. You can go to iOS store, you can go to Play Store, you can go to a bunch of other places where people can about anything. So you can go to Facebook, Twitter, all these things. Probably you want to do a sentiment analysis about Zomato, Swiggy. If you don't need to go to a single human because you have enormous amount of data on social media. But imagine, you want a data, uh, probably something like uh, more than census data, about someone in Northeast India, somewhere in Mizoram, or somewhere in Assam. It is not quite very easy for you to get all the features because first of all, Getting data itself is difficult in those uh, areas. Second, getting data from people who who believe that they are minorities in the society is second difficult because they may not reveal all the data. So that is where you have limited features, which also you know brings in the machine learning bias. The fourth thing is sample size uh, disparity, which is close to uh, in the first example we saw the cost, but uh, it is similar to what it is. That if you have two different groups, then you have enough information about one group, but you have very very less information about the other group. But like we usually see uh, in the case of uh, crime detection in the US, like whenever there is a case reported, only you can actually use it in your algorithm, right? So there has to be a case and it has to be reported and that report has to be in the uh, file data then only you can use this in a machine learning model what if the case was never reported so you can of course not use so this is how the sample size disparity comes into picture and then it even comes in your um, typical survey analytics when you if you have worked in survey analytics uh, or probably if you are uh, someone who follows Indian politics, probably you know that a lot of newspapers actually go to 10 people and then they say, okay, 7% would have said, I'm going to vote for this party and there will be like 70% chance of this party winning, which is nothing close to reality at all. First of all, they have not achieved a minimum sample size. It is not a randomized sample because you just go walk into the Decathlon and then ask people, so do you like Decathlon? So it's like, if you ask 
people who are inside decathlon, whether you like decathlon, it is highly biased uh, sample, right? So this kind of problem occurs, and that is sample size disparity. The final one is proxy, which is really, really useful for us even in our daily work. What is a proxy? Uh, everyone knows what is a proxy, but the thing is, imagine now you are trying to be a good machine learning citizen and then you are trying to remove all those um, protected uh, features. What are protected features or uh, sensitive features? The features that are controversial or the features that should not be considered. For example, a judge should not consider your race or religion when he is going to give you a verdict. It has to be completely what he should completely avoid what race you belong to, which country you came from, what is your religion, everything, and then the judgment has to be right. These are called sensitive variables in law, legal. So, the same way in machine learning, also we have all these variables, right? But we though are very happy to use gender, we race, everything. All we care about is what means if you go to Canada, what people usually care about. Leaderboard score means you have to get the silver medal, you have to get bronze medal, you have to get gold medal, make a LinkedIn post about it and then everyone likes it. This is what we all care about, but it's okay, for Kaggle it is okay. But if you are going to adopt the same culture in your workplace, then it is going to lead to a disaster because first of all those sensitive variables should be avoided in a proper legal setup and then the second thing is proxy. For example, let us assume that uh, you are in US, right? And uh, you are building a data set, uh, for, again let us uh, take crime prediction and you want to avoid races so you have uh, you have latino you have uh, indians you have asians chinese everything you have, you have all these races now being a good citizen you remove this column but imagine if you use pin code or a zip code uh, in your data set you get huge latinos who are uh, living near mexico if mexico is a border and then you have huge uh, um, latinos living just near Mexico and your pin code is now your proxy of your race because people usually try to cluster on their races and then your pin code is acting as a proxy. So these are the proxies that we have to be really careful because these proxies even though if you remove sensitive variables can bring in bias inside your machine learning model. So yeah, how do we mitigate it? Uh, the whole point of mitigation means you try to improve fairness in it, right? There are actually a lot of techniques um, starting from data preparation itself. There are so many papers that have been written about it in recent times because people are really discussing about it. But I have picked few things that is quite easy for us to start with in our uh, professional environment. So the first one is before you process the data, uh, you try to create a new learning representation um, which is like let's assume that your x is a sensitive variable or x uh, is something that can bring in bias which you think. Now what you try to do is you try to under you are trying to find the relationship between x and y, right? So now what you can try to do is you can try to use some mathematical transformation or um, um, there is a very famous talk that I wanted to quote at the end of the uh, presentation. In that talk, that the person he actually says in a feature space you have uh, your x, let us assume, and then now when you take something orthogonal to that x, that orthogonal that plane, hyperplane or whatever it is, it does not have any relation with this thing. But still you preserve some information from the deck. So you can do some technique like that to take a new learning representation, your new representation from the sensitive variable. The second thing is age old technique to remove overfitting, reduce overfitting, what do we do? We try to add regularization. Your linear regression is, uh, let us assume uh, overfitting, then probably you would go for a Lazo or a Ritz regression. So your deep learning is um, overfitting, so then you try to add uh, regularization to it, right? L1, L2. So the same way you can add regularization to bring down overfitting uh, and uh, the way you use overfitting again one of the reasons why overfitting happens because the machine learning model tries to learn the noise in your data as signal right because it is so eager to learn everything around it and then finally it captures noise as uh, signal so the way you can set penalization and the regularization to reduce that which means it will, you will dis discourage the model from learning from sensitive variables or proxies all these things and then the post processing technique is you can actually set a cap see uh, ultimately uh, this might become a trade off between your accuracy and your um, you know uh, your um, contribution to the society or uh, your social wellness right you either want to build a highly accurate model or you want to you are okay for the trade off between the high accuracy and a fair model right it is always a trade off so, because of course we are leaving out a lot of information, right? More information, better the model, and we are leaving out a lot of information. 
So what you can ultimately do is, you can set a cap, okay, I'm going to build an HR attention model and I really don't care about 95% accuracy by taking out, uh, taking in all the information like race, religion, from the institute where they came, all these things. I want to build a fair model and then I'm slightly okay with even 75% accuracy instead of 90% accuracy, but I want to make sure my model is fair. So you can take a call like that in your organization and you can set a threshold, uh, a score threshold beyond which you are not going to let your model learn. Uh, yeah, so the good thing is actually uh, uh, this is a plot that talks about number of research papers that was published related to uh, machine learning uh, fairness and bias. You can see in recent time, uh, since uh, 2016, uh, the number of papers have actually increased and uh, between 2016 and 17, you can see there's a huge increase, which, which means people have actually started talking about it, which is actually a very good thing. And uh, the next thing is, uh, this is part of a Kaggle uh, uh, developer survey. So if you are if you are active on Kaggle, you probably know that Kaggle does a developer survey every year, very much like how Hacker Rack and Stack Overflow does. So in that uh, developer survey, they had a question uh, in the uh, for the year I think 2019. They had a question around uh, what are what what is the most difficult thing in ensuring that uh, algorithms are fair and unbiased for. Uh, you know, typical Kaggle tools uh, you can consider as a representative of a typical data scientist in the society. And uh, the most thing that you actually discuss, it, the first one is uh, difficulty in collecting enough data, which is unbiased. And then the second thing is selecting appropriate metrics. So, one of this topic actually came into Kaggle survey again means people are actually trying to address this thing. And uh, that, that is that is the whole point of this thing. And then you can actually see the top two answers which people have answered. First, getting data which is unbiased itself is very difficult. And then selecting proper evaluation metric because we are so used to AUC, F1 score. Means for that matter, a lot of people do not even use F1 score when their data set is highly unbiased. They use AUC and uh, in an organization presentation, you go to a lot of conferences, they talk about 90% accuracy, 95% accuracy. Like if you are doing cancer prediction, your data set has 90% who does not have cancer and 10% who has cancer and you use a machine learning model and then you use accuracy as your word and then you are saying okay I identified 85 people out of 90 who did not have cancer, did not have cancer. What is it is, you don't need machine learning for this right. You can randomly call 10 people and then say okay uh, you had cancer, 9 people did not have cancer. You can do it as easy as that and that is where you have to use different metric and which is People really do not do because for marketing reasons and a lot of other reasons. And then you see a huge chunk that actually talks about I've never performed this task. Means uh, probably at this time of survey I also belong to that group. So this is something that we have to actually keep in mind uh, if you are if you are building a solution that is going to be your data point is human, very basic condition. If you are building a solution in which your data point is a human being, then probably you have to keep these things in mind. So. And that is where the most important topic actually comes in, which is interpretable machine learning. IML, which is one of the most growing domains within data science and machine learning itself, which is you do not just build a model and then you deploy it, like completely blind. You don't do that. Um, means it happens again predominantly on Kaggle where um, you stack everything, you ensemble everything and then you get the output because there it is completely fine, but the point is if you are building a solution for your organization or a social system, then you need to understand what goes inside that model and there are a lot of solutions for it. So um, this is your uh, typical black box model. Um, um, if you are building let's say random forest or uh, XGBoost or uh, you, you are building CNN or something like that, we, we have least bothered about even taking in, in random forest or XGBoost there are ways uh, in random forest that you can take a single tree as an output, you can actually visualize it as a decision tree. Decision tree is actually very easy to visualize and even in random forest uh, you actually get a bunch of things, right? So you can take a single tree and visualize it and this used to be the case before all these uh, good packages came into picture but what we are trying to do with uh, inter interpretable machine learning is now you are trying to understand what is inside it is, instead of just putting your model in production without knowing what is inside it. Yeah, um, IML is nothing but uh, you, you have to understand the predictions, like humans should understand what is going on within the predictions. Uh, if the benefits, first of all, the most important is fairness. Second, privacy, you try to find uh, whether sensitive variable is an important variable. Then uh, reliability, you actually trust your model, right? It means 
will you trust a doctor who just simply gives a medicine or will you trust a doctor who says uh, probably you might have had this thing you got food poison and then that is why you are giving i am giving this one. who will you trust more you will trust the doctor who gives you explanation of the cause of the disease who gives you explanation of what medicine it is otherwise what we do we just blindly take that pill put it in our mouth we don't even have time to read the name right so again having interpretable machine learning improves the reliability within teams because you have to understand data science team is not a stand alone team we don't work for ourselves we work for some other team like i work for marketing probably a google translate team uh, that uh, data science team is working for google translate product team so some team we are always working for some other team who is going to take our uh, output so reliability will really really improve if you explain your machine learning model and causality and trust trust is the most important thing so what so the least that anyone can actually do is write a single function do variable important plot you have this in every almost every algorithm if you are using cyclic learn you have it as a single function if you are using um, even he uh, explained it in um, fast data you can do it and uh, there are much many more algorithms the simplest that you can do is this thing but if you want to do more you know uh, probably line is there for local interpretable model agnostic uh, explainability which means you can use line for anything you build a random forest put that model inside line line will explain you why this is happening let it be regression let it be classification and there are uh, even for deep learning image recognition line can actually you know uh, cover that area to do image segmentation to show okay i have identified this as a dog because of this area so line is really useful and uh, there are a couple of more packages like uh, sharp is a jp sharp and then there is one more called el i5 uh, which usually stands for x line like i5 uh, but th these are these are out of box packages that can give you machine learning uh, model interpretability in just one single line of function which is then you have to you know read and uh, explain put it in your slide or wherever it is and that is the same thing what is the most important thing that people actually do the question is preferred uh, explaining or interpreting decisions that are made by so what is the preferred way that people actually use the first most thing people actually do is feature importance which is your variable importance plot if you are building a any machine learning model second thing is some people say that uh, they actually do a plot predictor versus accuracy uh, actual results which will avoid uh, you know the marketing kind of thing that i told you like uh, presenting in conference that we have got 95% accuracy in sentiment analysis then uh, there are a couple of more things um, so el5 is there line is there sharp is there and then also i think someone actually asked about the seed in the previous uh, uh, that is actually one of the standard techniques and a good practice which a lot of machine learning beginners actually miss so the problem is you want to build something that could be replicated in any other environment in this put your which machine or where you are using it right again like i said the whole point is um i think in pr uh, pr pragmatic programmer or some other book uh, it is uh, i don't know there, there's a famous quote that says the code that you write is for someone else to read not for you to read the same with the model that you build is for someone else to use it unless until you are someone like stock broker and then you are going to trade so there you write your model for your own self right but in most other cases you use it for someone else so as simple as setting a seed will help in machine learning reproduce model reproducibility and uh, again interpretability in a different environment and it will also solve the so called reproducibility crisis if you read about cognitive science papers it's a age old problem which is called reproducibility crisis okay so seed will solve it and then basic variable importance and then start using packages like line sharp or else uh I I have no idea about this topic uh, like uh, almost everyone else but I just got interested in this topic and I started uh, taking a huge bunch of notes and uh, this is all the links that I have referred uh, to this this slide is available online so you can simply click and use it and yeah this is what I had to present and uh, recently in Pytrader London there was a very very good talk about the same topic with lot more mathematical and uh, machine learning function notations you can learn uh, you can search on youtube for artificial stupidity by vincent the top topic is artificial stupidity the person's name is vincent he works for go data driven some company in the last so it's a very very good talk uh, it goes much much deep into whatever i have covered and uh, it is his talks are usually entertaining i have binge watched his talks his talks are usually very entertaining and uh, you will like that talk thank you very much any questions Uh, other experiments or something that we perfectly could have so yeah because it is not be standardized there is no metric but in a lot of papers there is no metric as an out of box solution 
but there are a lot of papers where they define uh, some mathematical functions which uh, could be you know implemented in future. And I think in the uh, Wilson talks, he has created uh, some package called Scikit Lego. This package name is Scikit Lego. Uh, it is available on PyPy, I think. So there, they have some functions to be built. Uh, so, the bias is coming in some of the classes have been for gender based on some teachers, say, which are going to be set standard. So, can we have some sort of a stratified K4 approach here? See, uh, any stratification or any uh, K4 approach uh, that you usually do is you. you yeah, that is the bias. Yeah, that is the bias. Sure. Yeah, that is where, that is how you can uh, make sure that this is not a there is no sample size disparity. Yeah. Like you can probably say, okay, in my data set I have 90 male, 10 females, but what I will do is I will make a stratified batch, make sure that 50 50 is there. Yeah. yeah, that is how you prepare data. So everything before uh, you get. Any further questions? Thank you. Thank you.